Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. This is good stuff. All right, friends, I want you to get a picture here. So act like you love Jesus and love each other. There you go. There you go. There you go. All right, now as Jeffrey uh, stole my thunder that a little bit, but here's what we're going to do. I want to practice a little bit. I want to see your most silly pose, gesture, face. We're going to see which side can do a better job. So trial run, first of all. So you, there you go, Tony. You got it. Good job. Oh, good job. Good job. Ready? The silliness. Go. All right. Good job, Ron. Good job. Here you go. Here you go. Colton, let's see. Go. All right. Sack, sack, sack. Okay, here we go. Now here's the real competition. Let's see if you do a better job. Ready? One, three. The most silly you can get. Let's go viral. Here we go. Ready? One, two, and three. Oh, all right. Good job. Good job. All right, you guys over here. Big Mike in the back, brother. Come on. Ready? One, two, and three. Uh-huh. Looks like Doug was doing a gang sign there. <laughs> Like a sign there. Jesus all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, in your copy of God's Word, Nehemiah chapter 12 today. Nehemiah chapter 12. And we are concluding our sermon series in the book of Nehemiah. And what a journey it's been. Amen? Amen. We are having our 11th uh, sermon today. We find ourselves at Nehemiah chapter 12. And in this chapter, we have Nehemiah and the people of God dedicating the wall. They're dedicating this project that God placed upon their heart that they faced so much adversity and overcame it. They were now dedicating it for God's glory. That's exactly what we're doing here today with our Mission Church of Lexington here at 3288 Beaver Creek Drive. This is a day where we are giving God all the glory that He deserves. Amen? Amen. Understand that we realize full well that, that we could not have done this without God that He also would not do without us. Amen? We had to show up. We had to contribute. We had to plan. We had to work. We had to commit. And we have some literal sweat equity in this thing. Jeffrey actually had some blood equity in it. He believed us they put stuff together. But uh, we actually spent a lot of time, and I'm grateful for the many, many, many people who made this possible. So if you are a member of our transition task force, those who have helped make this a physical reality, stand up so we can acknowledge you here now. That's especially you, Renee. Stand up, girl. All right. Thank you for that hard work. Love for everybody to be back tonight at 6.30. We'll have our, our uh, actual uh, building dedication. We'll have a recognition of all those who served well. 6.30 tonight. Be here, but I can tell you, lots of folks contributed to this. Um, now, whenever you dedicate a building, a new building can be one of two things for a congregation. It can either be a milestone or it can be a millstone. A milestone in the fact that it is a, it's a step in the direction that God is taking you. That is our next spiritual step of obedience. It's God giving us a, a new opportunity to reach a community for Jesus. Amen? Mm -hmm. This building may be so small you've got to go outside to change your mind, but it's still what we got for right now. Amen? Amen. And we're going to use this effectively, multiple service, maximize the space, Believing that in the fairly near future, we'll be able to expand as God provides means. But until then, we're going to use this place as good stewards for God's glory. Amen? Amen. But we also know that a new building can be a millstone. That can suck us down and draw us under and hold us back. If we ever, God forbid, ever look at a building as our main objective, we have missed the point. That a building is not our idol. A building is not our focus. This building is just a tool that we use for Jesus. Amen? The tornado came through, wiped this thing out. Guess what? We still meet under the shade tree out there. We'll still get our Bibles open and love one another and love Jesus. But while we got in the building like this, we want to use it as much as we can for Jesus. We don't want to let this property be a millstone to hold us back. We want it to be a milestone in the movement that God's taking us. 
We find that in Nehemiah chapter 12. They have finished this great task. If you remember our main character, Nehemiah, one of the heroes of the Old Testament, Nehemiah had this amazing job and opportunity in the Persian palace. He was the king's cupbearer. What does that mean? That he served as the king's confidant. He was basically the king's bodyguard. His job was to taste the food and drink the wine to make sure there wasn't an assassination attempt on the king. So he had an insider job. He had a cushy position. He got to meet the most royal dignitaries, eat the best food, and had a pretty squared away life. But he did not settle for that. Whenever God grabbed his attention, when God made it aware to Nehemiah that Jerusalem, God's holy city, was in disrepair. That the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and they were in rubble and in ruin. The city of God was being uh, endangered, but more importantly, the name of God was being jeopardized. That His name was being tarnished by those who were watching who were saying, Ha! You say your Yahweh is so great, well you don't even have a city unto the Lord. Your walls are broken down, you are victims and you are vulnerable. When Nehemiah heard this, it grabbed him at the core of who he was. He could no longer stand where he was and accept the ease and comfort. He said, I must do something about this. God grabbed a hold of him with a why bigger than himself. Nehemiah found his why. was to be obedient to God and do something great for Him. Friends, I'm here to tell you based upon the authority of God's Word that you have a why that God has for you as well. No matter what your age, your stage in life, no matter your economic standing, no matter your physical limitations, no matter your abilities or personalities, God has a why for you. God wants to use you to do something so amazing that only He can get the credit for it. Your job and my job is to find that why. Amen? Amen. To have our spiritual antenna up to hear when God's calling us and leading us in a direction we simply are obedient to that. We yield ourselves and say, I'm willing to step out of my comfort zones. I'm willing to abandon the things that are known to me. I'm willing to step into faith and take a risk. God, I'm willing to hazard it all for You. Why? Because You're worthy. Friends, if you come to that place in your life, it may not be rebuilding a wall around the city. It may not be something as grandiose as that, or it may be something even greater. But I can tell you, friends, that God has a why for your life. God has put you in this time, in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your sphere of influence for a reason. To give God glory to serve Him effectively. I hope that you've got a greater sense of that as we study through Nehemiah. But here's the reality we learn from this book in the Bible. Whenever you find your why, you say yes to Jesus, you step out in faith, not everybody's excited about that. Whenever you step out and do something for the Lord, there's always going to be naysayers. There is always going to be a critic. Here they had Sambalad and Tobiah and Geshem. These three other governors who were critical of Nehemiah and his building team. They would make fun of him. They would criticize him. And when that didn't work, they threatened his very life. Friends, you may be sitting here today and you've got a critic in your life. That you're trying to be obedient to Christ. You're saying yes to Him without knowing all the details. You're surrendering yourself to the Lord. You have someone in your life right now that's trying to tear you down. That's trying to be a distraction to you spiritually. It may be a spouse. It may be a child. It may be a parent. It may be a boss. It may be somebody that's specific to you, but they're trying to discourage you. Friends, don't let it happen. Overcome that knowing that the Bible says that we are more than conquerors because we're in Christ. Amen? Amen. That we don't have to be victims, we get to be overcomers. Amen. But not only did Nehemiah and his team face opposition from the outside, they faced opposition from the inside. That those inside of Jerusalem began to argue and fuss and, and complain about things. And friends, we find that to be true in most churches. That a church loses its momentum, it loses its effectiveness, it loses its uh, uh, usefulness. Why? Not because the outside attacks in, because the inside erodes from the inside out. When churches begin to fuss and argue and fight, when they lose their unity, when they lose their direction, when they lose their commitment 
to focusing on the main things, then we float all different directions. Thank God the Mission Church of Lexington has a high degree of unity. Amen? Amen. And we want to be intentional to maintain that. Friends, it's hard enough to overcome the adversities that are outside without having the challenges of self-inflicted wounds from the inside. May God help us to keep our focus upon Christ. I've learned this to be true. That people who are in the battle, in the spiritual fight, who are on the front lines, rarely can uh, complain and criticize. Amen? Those of you who are soldiers in this room, you know that when you're in the front line, you've got a job to do. You don't have time to complain about the food you're being served. You don't have time to complain about the equipment you're being issued. You simply got a job to do and you're focused on it, right? It's those who are on the backside who got ease and comfort and time to complain that loses focus, friends. We want to be on the front line of spiritual battle, amen? That we want to be out there, the tip of the spear, doing something for Jesus. Not being complacent and apathetic, but charging ahead for the Lord. If you're with me, if you're with me give me a hearty amen on that one. Amen. Okay. So Nehemiah faced those uh, obstacles, external and internal. He overcame them. And as soon as they were done building the wall, the very first thing they did was had a worship service. They brought out the preacher. They brought out a man named Ezra. And he brought God's Word. He opened it up. And the Bible says he read it from morning to noon. Amen? So uh, if you complain about the length of my preaching, you just understand. Ezra just read the Bible for six straight hours and people loved every minute of it. It showed the hunger they had for God's Word. And we reminded ourselves about the need and the dependence we have on God's Word. That what we, what we do with the Bible determines what God does with us. You as an individual, you as a family, and we as a church, and even we as a country. We get untethered from God's Word. We can flow in all different directions. So we want to stay anchored to the rock. But then last week we talked about repentance. That's a natural result of God's Word. Whenever you are under and you are in God's Word, conviction takes place. That there's awareness of our sin. The Bible is a mirror that's been held up to our life and shows our shortcomings. It shows our frailty. Most importantly, it shows our sin. Understand when the Word of God is preached, conviction should take place. For those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there should be a conviction. They should realize that they're living a life separated from Christ. Whether they are as bad as they could be or they're as bad off as they can be apart from the Lord, without salvation we are separated from a holy God. But every one of us, no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus, when God's Word is preached, it is showing the shortcomings. It is showing the sin. And we always have a next step of obedience. We always need to repent, turn from and turn to. And that's the natural result, the outcome, when God's Word is preached and proclaimed. And whenever you study it for yourself or hear it on the radio, when God's Word is being presented, it should be a time for you to pause and reflect. To look at your life and do an honest triage of your self-help and your spiritual wellness and be able to get those things right with God. Amen? Amen. Now today we come to the dedication of the wall. So they've had the walls built. The Bible was read. Repentance took place. And now they came to dedicate these walls. Understand that Nehemiah knew this wasn't about him. Here in chapter 12, he didn't begin to pat himself on the back and say, man, I am a high-level leader. Well, I sure got a great team here around me. Well, we really worked real hard and made this thing happen, pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. And then what do you say? God, thank you. God, this is because of you. God, we praise you, we glorify you, we honor you, we acknowledge that you've been the supreme and sovereign in this. What the dedication's for. Friends, that needs to be our hearts, heart set, our heartbeat today. Yes, God, this is an exciting day in our church. Yeah, a lot of people rose up and sacrificed time, energy, finances, lots of ways. But it isn't about any one of us. It's not even about all of us. It's about God. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's all about God. That's what this dedication in chapter 12 is trying to communicate to us. In your outline inside your worship bulletin, that three points to help us understand this chapter. 
Number one, they gathered at the dedication to survey. To survey. We see that here in verses 27 through 42. I'll give you advance warning. There's some hard names in here, so uh, uh, I will butcher some and skip others. All right? All right, here we go. Chapter uh, 12, 27 says this. Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing, with cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. Pause there for just a moment. So the Levites were what? The Old Testament ministers. These are the group of people that God specifically anointed and appointed as the clergy. And they were in all the surrounding communities as dictated by David back in 1 Chronicles. He said there needed to be clergy in all the community, Levites who led the people in spiritual practices. And here Nehemiah gathers them together for this great corporate worship time. They come together for a united purpose. So we see a response to the great work of God should be worship. Friends, that is our should be our natural default response. God created us for worship. When we rightly see God for who He is and what He does, our natural response should be worship to God. That we give Him the thanks and the gratitude that He rightly deserves. It says that they came together with instruments and with their voices. Friends, that we see that, um, that the instruments that we have playing up here today are a gift from God to us. Amen? Amen. That those who are gifted to use their instruments or to use their voices to worship is something that pleases and honors God. We see that all throughout Scripture. That we can use our singing and our spiritual uh, musical aptitude to give God glory. Music in itself is all moral. That means it's not good or it's not bad. It's how we use it that can be good or bad. Amen? And when we use our voices or our musical abilities to worship <laughs> God, it's a pleasing thing in God's sight. They were here and they were worshiping together. They were leading in this amazing worship service. And it goes on to say this. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Medophites, from the house of Gilgal, from the fields of Geba, and Asmatheth. For the singers uh, had built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. And the priests and Levites purified themselves and purified the people and the gates and the wall. So the first thing that happened for these uh, Levites, these leaders, was they purified themselves. That they made sure there was nothing in their life that would hinder their ministry or their service to others. Now, understand that that was not just for ministers. Myself and Pastor Randall and Pastor Jeffrey, we have to make sure that we are prayed up. Amen? Amen. That we're walking close to Jesus. That we don't have any unconfessed sin that's looming and lingering in our lives. That we cannot have things that hinders our work. If we do, we will not be able to serve God or serve you well. We said often in ministry, right, where people have, have charisma that takes them a lot further than their character can keep them. That people's speaking gifts and abilities can take them places where their virtue and their inner life cannot keep them. But friends, this is not a promise or a command just to ministers or to Levites. It's for every child of God. First Peter talks about you as a believer are a kingdom of priests. That you are a holy nation. That God has each and every child of God as a servant in His work. That's why we often speak about every member of the mission church is a missionary. Every member is a minister. Because God has a why for each of us. God has a ministry for all of us. And it's important for each and all of us to stay close to Jesus. To make sure that we are turning away from sin and turning towards Christ, which is called repentance. Because if we are not walking close to Jesus, we cannot effectively serve others. 
We learn that here from the priests. They make sure that they were clean before they led the people in worship. It goes on this. So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand on the wall toward the refuge gate. After them went a bunch of people there. I want to skip those names if you want to have trouble sleeping tonight and try to read those. <laughs> Just to kind of condense the time, you'll read a bunch of names there. Then verse 38, the other Thanksgiving choir, the other choir went the opposite direction, and I was behind them with half the people on the wall. So here's what happened. Nehemiah called all the people together. He had the leaders set apart for the ministry that they were to do, and they developed two choirs. Ezra and Nehemiah led different choirs. One was a preacher and one was a politician. They led two groups of people on the wall singing with jubilant praise to God. Why did they do that? To be able to come up on the wall and to have a survey of all that God had accomplished. They were able to be on this wall and say, look where we were just 52 days before this. See, the rebuilding project just took 52 days. This wall had laid in disrepair for 150 years. But Nehemiah's team came together in 52 days. They accomplished this Herculean task. And now they're able to rise up, to walk on this wall, to give glory to God and see all that God has done. Friends, do you ever take time to survey your life and realize how far God has brought you? That where you would be without Christ how He brought us out of the miry muck and put us on the solid rock. Amen. How far He has brought you in your life. Indeed, we all have a long way to go. We are all a work under progress. We all have a spiritual construction sign wrapped around our necks. But thank God we're not how we used to be. Amen. Amen. That we're walking closer, Lord willing, to Jesus today than you were a year ago or five years ago. If not, there's a spiritual problem. But God's brought us a significant long way. God's done the very same thing for this church, the Mission Church of Lexington. Think how far we've come from just two years ago. Two years ago, friends, we didn't exist. Two two years ago, there was no the Mission Church of Lexington. We began with a small but a mighty group. We began to study and learn God's Word together. The Holy Spirit began to move amongst that group and draw other people. We developed into a, an official service and constitute and all the things that have happened has brought us to this day. Amen. 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 But this is just another step in the road that God's taking us. This is not the finish line. This church is a launching pad, not a parking lot. Amen. Amen. This is just a beginning from all that God is going to do. It's always good to look back. just not good to stay there. Amen. Our dreams of the future must always be bigger and bolder than our memories of the past. Our best days are always ahead of us. Understand that happens to churches as they age. They often begin to look back and they think about the past and they forget that God still has future plans for them. They'll say, well, I remember how our church was in 1970. (laughs) I remember how things used to be. Well, friends, it doesn't matter how things used to be. We're pressing forward. Amen? Amen? We're looking for what God has in store next for us. It should be true in your lives, your families, and for our church. Now, remembering the past is a good thing. We just don't want to remain there or linger there too awful long. So two ministries, the choirs are walking around the wall. Now, if you remember, this is significant. All the way back in chapter 4, verse 3, remember that turkey named uh, uh, Tobiah? He said, hey, even if uh, your wall is so so weak and so pathetic that even if a little furry fox were to walk on your wall, it would knock it down. That was someone trying to be critical, trying to discourage the man of God, trying to discourage the people of God. Even if a little fox walked on your wall, it would knock it down. It's so paper thin. We're here, I think, in Nehemiah say, man, let's get our choir together. Let's get these hundreds of people up on this wall that's so robust and so thick that two choirs can walk around it together 
singing and praising God. And I think he probably looked down and saw Tobiah with his dejected face and probably went, na 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 na. Look what we can do now. Because that's the greatest way that you can speak back to your critics in your life. Amen. Amen. Don't spend a lot of time getting sucked into their criticism. Don't try to even defend yourself before them. You just live for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let the evidence of your life speak volumes. Let people see God working in your life, in your family. The difference that only God and His Word can make. Build a life on that sure foundation and those who are being critical of you. Why would you follow Jesus? Why would you go to that church every week? Why do you make business plans the way you do? Why do you choose not to do this or do that? And they criticize you and try to draw you down, but you just keep focused on Christ. And one day you'll be able to look back and survey the land and see all that God has done for you. And guess what other people are looking and saying, my goodness, this is undeniable. God was in this. Amen? Amen. That's what you want God to be able to do in your life. Napoleon had a brand new drummer boy in his regiment. It was said that they went into a, ba a battle that was hot and fierce, and the war was tenacious, and Napoleon's soldiers were dying left and right, and Napoleon, which was out of character for him, decided to retreat. So he called for his boy, drummer boy and said, Make play the song of retreat. And the drummer boy said, No, sir. Napoleon repeated himself, Son, play the song of retreat. The drummer boy said, No, no, sir. Napoleon was shocked and appalled. How could there be such a resistance to his authority and his command? He said, Son, why won't you play the song of retreat? The little drummer boy said, I never learned that tune. <laughs> Friends, Nehemiah could have sounded the song of retreat dozens of times. Even when he first arrived to Jerusalem, if you remember that midnight ride that Nehemiah took around the wall, by the way, she said the wall was in such disrepair you could not finish the, so the whole circumference. You could only go halfway and return home because it was in such disrepair. The stones were tore down. The gates were burned up. It was a overwhelming sight. And Nehemiah could have said, oh I man, I made a big mistake. Put his tail between his legs, went back to Persia, tried to get his old job back, and forgot he ever had this wild idea. But no, my friends. He said, this is worthy of my effort. This is something big enough and great enough and honoring enough to God I'm going to put all myself into this. I'm fully committed to this. I'm not going to be double-minded. I'm all in for God. And because He made that decision, look what the outcome was. Because I hope this is an encouragement to you as you're finding your why, as you're living your life, don't call the sound of retreat. Even if the times are dark, even if the times are frustrating, even if things feel overwhelming to you right now, even if the challenges are large, understand that Christ is larger. Amen? Amen. As the front of your bulletin says in Philippians 4.13, that's a powerful verse of the Bible. It talks about how we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? That's right. That doesn't mean that we can just come up with the all things we want to do. That means that in Christ, whatever God wants us to do, we can do. You study that passage in Philippians chapter 4. It's really talking about commitment. Or a contentment, I should say. Contentment. This is about Paul saying, hey, I can be abased. I can have nothing. I can have a lot. I can over be overbounding. But either way, I can be content. Through Christ, all things are possible. So I think this is really the sign of greatest spiritual maturity. Nehemiah, when he stepped into this, he didn't like think he had some magic formula. He didn't think, well, if I pray the right prayer and bind the evil spirits and demand God to do this or that, then, then God has to make this thing happen. Well, I think Nehemiah simply just took his next step of obedience. And this is what God revealed to me. This is what God wants me to do. And I'm going to do it. Even if I fail, I'm going to do it. <coughs> Even if I go back to Jerusalem and I can't get anybody to help me, I'm still going to do it. Even if i got to do it all by myself, even if the resources don't show up, 
even if Sam Ball and Tobiah ridicule my name, even if that open letter they wrote gets back to Artaxerxes, the king, and he thinks I'm trying to overthrow his kingdom, he sends his soldiers to kill me. Even if my enemies overwhelm me, I'm still going to be faithful to God. Friends, can you say that? Can you say, God, I'm just going to be faithful to you regardless of what the consequences are? My, one of my mottos I try to use is obey God and leave all the consequences to Him. Simply lead, live for the audience of one and allow God to be the Lord of the results. Amen? Mm -hmm. Nehemiah did not sound the song of retreat. Continue to pep, press forward. That's why they could, at this uh, dedication, they could survey how far God had brought them. Number two, they gathered at the dedication to celebrate. To celebrate. Verse 43, I love this verse. I think it may be the hinge verse of this entire dedication account. Also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. How many times can rejoice or rejoice be in one verse? <laughs> Repeatedly. You know, I think repetition is the mother of all learning, and Jesus said, uh, God knows that, right? So it says rejoice. Friends, I want to tell you this that joy should be a primary characteristic of a Christian. Amen? Amen. Now understand, joy and happiness are different things. Happiness depends on the happenings around you. Joy depends upon Jesus. Amen. Happiness is gathered by looking out. Joy is developed by looking up. Here these folks had great joy because they had their eyes focused on God. Friends, I'm not here to tell you that we have to stick our head in the sand as a Christian and pretend like everything's alright when it's not. Understand that life is hard. Amen? Life is tough. Life does some hard things to us. Maybe right now you are dealing with a son that just recently passed away very unexpectedly. Maybe right now you're dealing with a painful sciatic nerve in their back. Maybe right now you're dealing with losses of jobs or addictions. Friends, I want you to know that those things don't make us happy. That'd just be sadistic. Those things are hard. But understand we can still have joy. Why? Because we're focused on Christ. We understand that all that mess that we're going through, that God wants to use it for a message. That all that pain we're walking through, that God has a purpose in it. That God wants to use the hard things of our life Turn those hurts into hallelujahs. Amen? Amen? We can still have joy even when we lack happiness. Here they came with great joy. Rejoicing. Reminds me of a little girl who went to the zoo for the very first time. Just a little girl. She'd never seen many of these animals before. Specifically a mule. <laughs> she looked at this mule up and down and was trying to make sense of this strange beast and said... Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what you are, but you must be a Christian if you look just like my grandpa. <laughs> hey, a long face, a scowl is not a very good billboard for Jesus. Amen? That I tell you what, a lot of people, you can see the joy of the Lord in their face. That you can be able to see that they have a little something close to Jesus. Just by the, 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 the atmosphere of who they are. Amen? Understand that many people add joy when they leave the room. You don't want to be that way as a Christian. <laughs> you want to make sure that people not only hear, but see Christ in you. And one way you can do that, one witness you can have, is have the joy of the Lord in your life. I love this too, that they came, they worshiped, and it was so robust. It was so amazing that verse 43 at the end says, the joy was heard afar off. So all the surrounding communities, the people who were not yet followers of God, they heard this worship. They heard the crowds. They heard the choir. They heard the celebration. And it impacted them. Friends, that's our desire it was at the ministry center, the little uh, office complex we had. We wanted to worship so robustly at Refuel that everybody in the whole complex heard us. Amen? Amen. It's our same desire here. 
There's a little location right here on top of this little hill at 3288 Beaver Creek. We want to be so full of life and energy and spiritual power that everybody around says, man, there's something different about that place. There's a supernatural magnetism. Amen? Amen. Then when people come in the doors and say, man, these people actually think they love each other. They love God. There's some joy there. Does it feel like a funeral service? It feels like a celebration. Amen? <coughs> And friends, that's not just for us as a church. That should be true for you as an individual. Yeah. That when people see your life, they see something different. There was once a philosopher uh, that he was from Germany, and he said this, if Christians expect me to believe in their Redeemer, they have to try to act a little bit more redeemed. <laughs> we need to be able to allow people to see a difference in us. Amen. That's what it means to be a witness for Christ. Matthew 5.16, my life verse, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do people see this in your life? A celebration. Understand that we don't just celebrate when we feel like celebrating though. Happiness and joy, right? Happiness is circumstances. Joy is Jesus. You don't want to base your relationship with Christ or your obedience to the Lord on your feelings. If you base it on your feelings, you'll never get started. Feelings will lie to you. Feelings will deceive you. Feelings fluctuate. We want to base our lives and our faith upon what? Facts. Upon Jesus. Upon truth. Amen? Amen. Understand that God never does His greatest work in the most shallow end of humanity. And our feelings are our most shallow end. They are so fickle. They rise and fall hundreds of times in a day. For some of you women in an hour. <laughs> rise and fall. Rise and fall. For us guys too. Jeffrey's movie. Um, <laughs> but we want to base our, our commitment upon what? Truth. Amen? The truth is what? That God never, will never leave us or forsake us. The truth is greater seed that's in us than He's in the world. Amen. The truth is that if we trust Christ, we've got salvation. Amen. For being to Him, He's got a purpose for our life. If we worship God, it pleases Him. Sometimes we do things just because it's our duty to do. And then the light follows. Amen? Amen. Some people are so shallow, they say, well, if I don't feel like it, I won't do it. My friends, that's a low way of living. We sometimes just do what we're supposed to do and the feelings follow that's a little tip I'll give you as a sermon for a different day, but I'll give you a little taste of it. That's the key to marriage. You know that? If you say, I'm going to wait to show love and care and compassion to my wife when I feel like it, or my husband when I feel like it, you'll never get around to it. But if you go ahead and act, you do what you're supposed to do, you serve, you love, you care, you do the things you're supposed to do, then the feelings will eventually come. The feelings are like the dessert. They're not necessary for your good health. The main course is obedience. Amen? Came here to celebrate. Celebrate what? God. All that God had done. It says the first thing they did was sacrifice. They came together in verse 43 there and they offered great sacrifices. Sacrifice in the Old Testament were what? Foreshadows of the sacrifice. Of what Christ did on the cross thousands of years after this. Actually, that's not thousands. Nehemiah is 500 years. About 500 years before Christ. So these sacrifices that were taking place they were foreshadowing something that happened about 500 years later. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, who came to an earth, put on an earth suit like ours to be identified with men and women just like us. To face the same heartbreaks and the same hurdles that we face, yet with a big difference that He never fell prey to those. Never committed one sin. Never even told one little white lie. Always was obedient to God the Father. Lived a perfect sinless life. Was bold and powerful. Was not a weak Jesus, meek and mild, but He was a bold prophet, Messiah of God. But died an innocent man was taken by Roman hands and placed upon a Roman cross and died innocently with people jeering and ridiculing Him. 
Saying if you are so great there, Jesus, if you can help other people, if you can heal the blind and walk on water, why don't you just come down off that old cross? Show yourself as special as you say you are. And Jesus could have done that at any second. But He chose willingly, knowingly, to hang on that cross. As He hung there, taking the sin of us, of mankind, upon His weary and bruised body, He had died. Literally, actually died. God the Son died on the cross. To prove that, a Roman soldier stuck a spear in his side and blood and water poured out just to confirm that this criminal was actually dead. They took his limpless, lifeless body from that cross, marched it to an empty tomb, placed his body inside of that tomb and rolled a large stone in front of it. And all the religious leaders, all the critics, began to wipe their hands. Thank goodness we got rid of that troublemaker. We are glad to have him out of our hair. We're so glad to get that rebel out of the way. They thought they had it all taken care of. But God had a different story. On the third day, Jesus Christ rose visibly and victoriously from the grave. He showed Himself alive to many eyewitnesses. Even 500 at one time in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, hey, I know this happened. If you doubt it, go ask the other eyewitnesses who are still alive. They'll tell you. We saw Jesus, this man who was dead. This man who had no life left in Him. Three days later, He was alive before us. We could touch Him. We could hear Him. We had a meal with Him. We could walk and talk with Him. He's alive. Not just a hallucination. Not just a mirage. Not just a symbolism of a resurrection in their hearts. No, indeed, Jesus visibly, physically arose from the dead. Friends, I'm here to tell you this. If that is true, if that is true, it demands an impact on your life. That's right. It demands a response from you. If that is true about Jesus, and if I didn't believe that was true, I'd shut my Bible and never preach again. But I believe it is so true, my Bible is wide open, and I don't want to ever be quiet about that truth. Amen? Amen. Because that is the foundational difference between our faith, Christianity, and any other world religion. Friends, our faith is based upon a bloody cross and an empty tomb. It's not just a list of do's and don'ts. It's just not a way to feel better about ourselves. It's not just an existential, hey, there's got to be something else out there. Friends, no. It's on the reality that our Savior arose from the dead. That truth to transform our lives. We no longer have the right to say, well, Jesus is... Probably a pretty good guy. Probably a great teacher. Well, maybe he's a good legend. My friend, that, that falls so short. If Jesus really did what Jesus said He did in the Word, He has to be the all-consuming purpose of our lives. He can't just be a little extra piece of what we already do. He can't be somebody that we just come to church and get a little Jesus jolt and feel better about ourselves. If Jesus really did what it says He did, it needs to be the total gripping truth of our lives. It should be what informs and empowers everything we do. However, most of us, especially here in our comfortable culture, we take Jesus as just kind of a nice mascot. Uh, I'm a Christian because I'm Republican. I'm a Christian because I'm an American. I'm a Christian because I'm not Jewish. I'm a Christian because I'm not Muslim. Friends, that's not what makes you a Christian. You can be a Christian without even having Christ in your life. Do you know that? Yeah. I, only, I don't want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christ follower. man. Yeah. A devoted, born again, totally yielded, completely abandoned, following after Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen? There is no middle ground. Either all in or you're not. Jesus said that. If you're not for me, you're against me. He even made the priority, if you love anybody, including parents, 
or children more than me, you're not worthy of me. Jesus said, you can't put your hand to the plow, begin to plow and look back. If you do, you've, you've lost focus. He wants our full attention. You can't just be a fan of God. You must be a follower of Christ. Amen? That's what they were celebrating here. The reality that God made this possible through the sacrifices foreshadowed Christ. And friends, that's what we're here to do today ourselves. And third and finally, they gathered at the dedication to serve. They gathered to serve. Verse 44 through 47. I'll read just the first part of this for time. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse of the offerings, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities and portions specified by the law for the priests, the Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests, the Levites who ministered. Ministered. First of all, I'll say this. They weren't even Baptists. We're talking about tithes. Amen. Golly. Most people say, I don't want to go to church and they want my money from down there. Well, friends, I tell you this. Tithing, giving, being faithful with our finances is a spiritual principle. Amen. That we are stewards of what God has given us. That Jesus speaks more about our money, more about money than you something He does heaven or hell. Understand that whenever we give to God, it is an act of worship. And here's the biblical principle for tithe. What's a tithe? 10% of our income. That's the beginning mark for biblical giving. That 10% of what God gives to us, we give back to God. We don't give the 10% to manipulate or control God. We don't give 10% so God will give us more. We give because what? God first gave to us, right? The sign of thankfulness. Understand that God owns 100% of all that we have. He asks for us to be faithful with 10% to give back to Him as a starting point. But He owns all of it. He could demand that he, we give Him 90% and when we only keep 10%, He'd be totally just in that. Thank you God for not doing that. But He could have. He would totally justify it. He did Because He's gracious. Did you be faithful at 10%? Why? Because when you're giving your 10%, Lord, it shows where your heart is at. You can tell a person's priorities. You can tell what's important to a person by looking at two things. Their date book and their checkbook. How do you spend your time and how do you spend your resources? If you did an honest evaluation, you would see what the idols are in your life. Where do you spend most of your time and spend most of your resources? I'd add to that. What do you think about the most? You know, for us, if this is true. Jesus should be the first thing we think about when we get up. He should be on our mind all through the day. He should be the last thing we think about at night. He should be in our dreams. Amen. Amen. He should be that important to us. We say every Sunday when we take up our offering, we do it just a matter of moments. We're going to continue to worship God through stewardship. Stewardship is worship. Now, 10% is how we check our obedience to God. God clearly says, this is what I want you to do. You do it. That doesn't really check our sensitivity to God. What we give above and beyond the 10% shows our sensitivity to God. Are we willing to listen to the Spirit saying, hey, I want you to give to this cause? Whether it's a building fund, whether it's a local ministry, whether it's a homeless shelter, whether it's a Samaritan purse, whether it's a adopting a kid, whether it's you fill in the blank. It would be different for every one of us. But how are you using your resources to be a blessing and to serve God and to serve God's people? That was one of the first parts of the ministry here. They were serving God with their finances. But number two, just said they ministered. That they served. That they didn't just sit. They served. Understand that Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's not something you just come and receive. You come and receive and you contribute. Amen? An old man who was mute, lost the ability to speak, was writing to his daughter and said, Sweetheart, one of the hardest parts about being mute, unable to speak, is waking up every morning and not having a voice to praise God. He thought about it a little while and he added a little amendment to it. But there is something worse than not having a voice to praise God. 
What's worse is having a voice but no desire to praise God. Friends, we all have many opportunities, abilities, and resources. Voices and bodies and finances and time and energy. We have these things, but are we using them to serve God? Are we using all those to serve ourselves? The Christian life, the essence of it is what? To love God and love people. The way you love is by serving. You see, we can give without loving. We can never love without giving. When you love God, you love God's people. If you love God and love God's people, you can't help but to serve. Amen. All right, close your eyes. Heads bowed and eyes closed.